Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Modern Web. My name is Tracy. I'm one of your hosts today. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Leet and I am joined by my other co-host Ben Lesh. Hi Ben. Hey, how are you? Hello. Where can we find you on the internet? Uh, at Ben Lesh on Twitter. Ooh. Make sure to stalk Ben. He's got some good things going on. <laughs> And then uh, we are joined by the lovely Peter. And Peter, we're so excited to have you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, and where can we stalk you on the internet? Uh, Peter PME on Twitter, all one word. It's Peter PME everywhere. Instagram, GitHub, Twitter, et cetera, LinkedIn. Awesome, very cool. And so today we're gonna talk about uh, two kind of exciting things. Well, actually a few exciting things, but let's start off with the top, uh, the, the top, the top script. I meant the topic of TypeScript, but instead I said the top script. Um, is that a new framework? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Somebody please create TopScript JS right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it TypeScript JS, do you think? Or is it just TypeScript? Is there a TypeScript JS? I bet there is. I would literally die. <laughs> okay, let's talk about important things. So TypeScript and ReasonML. Um, you are very passionate about these two technologies. Tell us a little bit more about why. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm primarily, I'm biased towards Reason. I really am. Uh, you know, after I got to know Jordan Walk, the creator of React, Right, and I sort of heard this whole story about how React came about, right, and like the problems that he was solving years and years ago, right, and then that sort of led up to what uh, ReasonML is and the problems that it's trying to solve. Um, and believe it or not, both languages are pretty old, right? I think TypeScript's like ten years old, right? And then o and then Reason, based on OCaml, is like you know tens of years, twenty, thirty, uh, or so years, right? Um, but anyway, so ReasonML is this JavaScript-like syntax built on top of OCaml. Um, and we've seen stuff like this before, right? You could say it's a competitor to CoffeeScript or TypeScript or any sort of like, I'm writing your closure script, right? Any sort of like, I'm writing a different language that's compiling to JavaScript, right? We've seen this before. We know how this usually plays out. And normally I would uh, sort of like shelf something like this. But what intrigued me about Reason is a, you know, it came from, you know, a very reputable, very smart uh, individual, right? Somebody who, you know, came up with the idea for a framework that is one of the most popular frameworks in the world now, right? So there was, it was definitely worth listening to. Um, and just like this, the ability to type your code without having the types get in the way, right? Uh, we use both TypeScript and Reason at DraftBit, right? Our, our backend is TypeScript because there's just better GraphQL uh, support for generating resolvers or whatever. And then our front end is mostly Reason and React. Um, and the thing that I like about Reason is uh, the syntax is a little different, but it's all stuff that you can get used to. Uh, the types don't get in the way either. I don't have to type everything, right? For the most part, I never have to type anything at all and reason knows what, what is going on, right? Uh, and that was, that was what the Diffie-Hellman type system was aimed to solve, right? And that's sort of the, the type system used by, you know, languages like Haskell and standard ML or whatever, right? Uh, so anyway, on top of that, reason is very fast. And the, the way that you can compile it out of your code uh, to JavaScript is through a system called BuckleScript that was developed at Bloomberg. Uh, by Bob Zhang, also a very, very smart person, right? So there wouldn't be a reason if it wasn't uh, for BuckleScript at Bloomberg, right? Uh, financial companies seem to do a lot of uh, re uh, OCaml or functional libraries. I don't really know why it was started there or whether they use it, but, you know, like uh, they, they continually support it and grow it and it's getting better and better, you know, uh, every week, right? So. Uh, how's that for, sometimes I like to spin out of control, so I'll, how's that for, for an intro? That was a pretty good intro. I would love Ben's opinion. When I heard CopyScript, I'm like, oh man, how many times has Ben been trolled about, like, art shit? Yeah. Isn't that like CopyScript? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, no, like, uh, honestly, I haven't spent too much time in reason. Um, I think it's a super interesting language. The, the, the one thing that, that I don't know if I'm super a huge fan of is, is the, is the what al algebraic effects type things. Like, um, I'm not a big fan of, of, uh, how similar things exist in, in JavaScript or other languages, like try catch, like the whole catch channel, like spooky action at a distance, like something happened in some code over here and then magically this other code knows that it happened. Um, but otherwise it seems like a really solid language. I, I was looking the other day to see if there was like an Rx implementation, which is funny because Rx exists in like every language. I didn't see one. Um, there actually, no, there was one, but it was like archived or whatever, but, but uh, that's kind of one of my go-to, like, I wonder if I can understand this better by looking at something I'm intimately familiar with that as it's implemented in another language, but I haven't found too much with that. I mean, the, the implementation that did exist, they were modeling it pretty heavily after um, RxJS, which was interesting, uh, but, but yeah, so I haven't, I haven't messed with much with it. So for production, um, my understanding is reason is mostly for UI development. Is that correct? Or can you use it for like node type development as well? Yeah. So um, right now the, the story for compiling reason to JavaScript has been figured out, right? So you could write any type of client code that compiles to JavaScript or server code. Like, uh, you know, they have like VS express and I'm, I'm putting like a full stack uh, app together right now that uses express and socket IO on the server, compiles it to JavaScript, right? So the same way that you'd use the TypeScript compiler. But uh, the exciting part that's still, you know, sort of like in the works is reason native, right? And reason native is just native, you know, compiles this like super tiny byte code, right? A uh, little bundle for you, right? Okay. Um, Jared Forsyth, for example, built a native uh, menu bar app, right? And so he rebuilt like the Qmoji. It's, it used to be an electron wrapper that was like a couple hundred megabytes and used, you know, like a couple hundred megabytes of RAM when loaded up, right? Uh, and then just like he rewrote it in Reason Native uh, and it was like a two megabyte bundle that used like 40 megs of RAM on your computer, right? So that, that didn't use any JavaScript, just compiled down to whatever Mac OS was able to read and it just worked. So hmm. that's still sort of, you know, you can do it if you, if you're a pioneer, right. Uh, but you know, there's no like easy path to get there. Right, right, right. So what's, I'm trying to think of the name of the, um, oh, what's, what's the name of the, the Google one that just came out that compiles to native for mobile. Uh, that's built it's not off flutter, of, right. Or the, yeah, flutter. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's built off of dart, um, mm -hmm. which was, I don't know, do you remember when they, they were like, yeah, Dart's going to be native in Chrome. And then they're like, oh, wait, hold on. Forget that. <laughs> that's, that's not true. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, how does the, do you know how is it is the native when it's building native, are they targeting, they want to target mobile with it, I'm assuming, or? Uh, eventually, yeah. So Flutter's got a way better story for uh, native mobile, right? Uh, but the plan is there's a, there's a very popular reason React Native project. That, that all that does is it, it exposes all the JavaScript side of React Native to Reason, right? But ultimately, it, it would still go from Reason to JavaScript to, you know, the React Native core with the bridge, right? Uh, there is work being done that would allow you to eliminate that JavaScript step and just go to a native binary or bundle or whatever, but um, that's still a little off. So Flutter's got a better story when it comes to that. Yeah. Can I ask also, um, what does the ML stand for? Is it, it's not machine learning, right? Um, I always forget, honestly, it's either meta language or markup language. Okay. I think it's, okay. I think it's meta language because I think that's what the, the ML stands for in OCaml. Yeah, that's what it, that's what it is. Yeah. So like o OCaml is, my understanding is it's, uh, it's particularly popular amongst people that are writing um, other languages, essentially, like because you can you can take it and use it to. It's because it's a meta language or whatever. You can you can use it to describe uh, various behaviors in languages. So, so in our camel, the, do they like always default to camel case? Uh, <laughs> no, but there's lots of bumps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> speaking of uh, compilers, like somebody rewrote uh, Webpack in Reason, and it's like 10 times faster or 100 times faster or whatever. Right? Oh, so, man. Um, it's pretty cool, right? It's like a, you know, it's a very engineer type person, not much of a, a marketer, right? So it's still got, uh, you know, some work to go community wise. But uh, some of the things that people have been writing are just radical. Um, you know, uh, there's this library called Relay, which is just in Reason. And um, let's say you are one of those pioneers that uses Reason on the server. Some folks do. Uh, the messenger.com platform team uh, is 100% Reason, right? And they have, I don't know, I heard like, you know, 5,000 tests, right? Just across the entire thing. And Relay, right, the stuff written in uh reason runs like a thousand tests every half a second right uh so the performance is just radical uh and the compilation steps are cool too so the reason why i was particularly excited about you know potentially using uh reason on the server at DraftBit was to be able to just like test things instantly have tiny bundles right ocaml's got this whole thing around unikernels right now when you deploy an app you might be using docker Right, which is like a you know this container that lives inside of a Linux environment that spins up, right? Or you might be deploying to a VM, right? Which also needs Linux as its host because of all the tools that uh you know that that your app needs. Well, with you know with OCaml and Reason, you can just say I want the the networking uh, package and I want this, and then you can run that app on bare metal, right? So maybe that doesn't matter. I was just muted. Maybe that doesn't matter for. Um, you know, small companies, right? Because the changes are insignificant. But imagine somebody like Facebook, you know, like compi compiling their reason microservices to bare metal and then running that, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential when it comes to using something like that. Uh, that sounds really amazing. It's almost like, I mean, you know, given that I haven't really looked at reason yet, and I'm just kind of gathering stuff based on what you're saying, it definitely makes me want to play with Reason, uh, but, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, Jay Phelps, of course, and his uh, WebAssembly obsession, you know, when he got excited, I'm like, oh, well, why isn't everyone doing WebAssembly, yeah. you know, and, and then he convinced me as a JavaScript developer that I don't actually care about WebAssembly, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, like, with Reason, um, is that, you know, I mean, does it just, like, compile to, you know, directly to something. So it's like, is it lower layer then or lower level then kind of like WebAssembly or am I just making two things not the same? <laughs> it's like, it's like TypeScript, you know, like, uh, so for example, uh, you can, let's say you did create React app or Angular. There's like a BS Angular uh, thing too. People wrote bindings to use Angular with reason. Uh, so you could, you could write, let's say you've got a big app already and there's no way that you're going to convert it all to a reason, right? Mm -hmm. You can incrementally introduce it, right? And then uh, the cool part is with reason, there's this really uh, smart individual named Cristiano who uh, sold infer to Facebook, which is the static analysis tool. And he's been writing something called gen type for a reason. So let's say you've already got a TypeScript code base and you're very strict about the type system. And you want to be able to convince the rest of your team that reason is the right step forward. What gen type will do is we'll, we'll generate perfect types from your reason code that can then get be consumed by a TypeScript in your app without having to do anything. Right. So it's, it's really radical. Right. So let's say, you know, your team's not sold, but you really want to give reason a shot. You, you, you put the bsconfig.json file the same way that you might have tsconfig, right? And then you'll run the reason compiler, which is, you know, like, you know, RE, yarn re watch or npm run re watch or whatever you want it to be. Um, it'll generate a, a TS file with all the types on top of the React component or Angular component or whatever, right? So now you, you know, you get the best of both worlds. You, you've got your first reason PR, right? Letting the team see it without sacrificing any of the benefits of the ecosystem that you're already utilizing. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I haven't, I actually had not heard that you could uh, get TypeScript types out of reason. That's uh, that's pretty new information to me. Um, 
I think one of the things that I heard, and this has been, it's been a couple of years maybe since I'd heard this, but one of the things about Reason is that um, since it's fairly new and still in development, uh, that a lot of, the, the main reason a lot of people aren't using it yet isn't necessarily because it's, um, how do I put this? It's not necessarily because it's, it's bad or unpopular, but mostly because it's in a solid state of flux. And the, the team themselves, I think we're, we're recommending that if you're using, if you're developing like some heavy production app that needs a lot of stability in the code base that you might not want to use Reason. Is that still the case? Uh, it used to be about a year ago, that was still very much the case. Um, maybe two years ago. They went through a huge, this was when I was sort of jumping on board and I wasn't comfortable with this either. I'm not some sort of like pioneer that tries, you know, like I, I'm the CTO of a, a 10 person startup, right? Like I, I can't, you know, I don't like go into like, I don't explore like Haskell or, or Rust, right? Like more than I need to. So just, just throwing that out there. So when Reason was going through um, the syntax change, like that's, that turned me off too back then. It was about two, two and a half years ago. The syntax went from looking like OCaml to looking like JavaScript. And that, that was the case, but so far for the last like year and a half or so with syntax three, um, it's been very stable. Uh, you know, I think some folks, um, you know, are surprised as like Reason React, for example, which is the bindings for uh, React JS haven't been really like haven't been updated since hooks came out right because everything else is just supported right there's not much that needs to happen right so that's been excuse me the case for the last like nine months right so stability so far like is is you know it's like fine there are breaking changes that buckle script does but you don't have to opt in right you know like we're not using the latest version of buckle script because it changes some things and that's totally fine right um the, what buckle script does is it generates a readable JavaScript, right? So sometimes it's nice to go into that generated JavaScript file. It's not mangled, right? And just like see like, okay, this is what I wrote in reason. Let's compare to see what's going on in the, on the JavaScript side. So there are improvements to that, but it's not like, oh my goodness, we need this change. And now we're going to have to spend a week refactoring our code base to get it to work, right? That hasn't been the case. Um, you know, one could argue that you know, as a startup, maybe choosing reason isn't, you know, like smart, right? But I, but after my experience with, you know, draft it for the last like two years, I think it's been one of the most, uh, most productivity improving tools that we have uh, introduced, right? So that being said, I am the reason person on the team, right? At least uh, I was. Now we've got four reason people, right, on the team who are very much into the ecosystem. And when it comes to refactoring, when it comes to adding new modules, right? Like the stuff that we write in a reason never breaks in production. Um, the stuff that we have on the TypeScript side or the JavaScript side does break, you know, more often than not, like any code base would, right? But if we decided to remove a prop from a reason component, um, it'll let us know, right? It'll say, hey, you changed this, right? Like go update it. Uh, and it'll tell us all the places that we, we've removed that prop or we changed it from a string to an int, right? Uh, and that's really beneficial, right? That's helpful, especially for a tool as complex as DraftFit. Do you think that's because uh, TypeScript allows you to opt into loose behaviors? Is is that the the big thing? Like, if you were, were, would you say you were using TypeScript in its strictest way, and it was still causing those problems, or it was just like every now and then someone opted into any because they had to get something done, and then made problems? Yeah, we do use uh, the strictest version of TypeScript. Uh, on the back end, and that'll still that'll still cause issues because the thing that Reason does that I think a lot of folks uh, struggle with at first coming from JavaScript is it eliminates this whole null and undefined, right? So that uh, it eliminates a whole class of errors, right? And understanding whether whatever language you're coming from, like how to unguard or unwrap or whatever, right, is something that folks struggle with, right? you have this like request from your server, right? You have to type that, you have to type that response. And then it's either something or nothing, right? And it sounds so easy, but just from my experience of learning reason in the very beginnings, I struggled with the idea of, what do you mean there's no null or undefined? Like, what do you mean this is either something or nothing, right? So uh, when it comes to 
even deploying TypeScript, like we still have those like null or undefined errors that like pop up here and there. Whereas the reason side just just doesn't, you know, for whatever reason. Is is that a decent answer? No, that makes sense. That makes total for sense. For whatever reason. Good joke. <laughs> That's the worst part about the name. So many times. Is there puns. a reason you, you can't, use reason? You can't. How do I reason about tracing. reason? <laughs> you cannot uh, sneak a pun past her. So um, let's uh, switch gears for a second because you mentioned DraftBit, and you know you are the CTO of DraftBit. So what is DraftBit? DraftBit is a tool that helps teams build mobile apps visually directly from the browser. So um, let's say that you want to build a mobile app. You could be somebody that's never built an app before, right? You could be on a product team somewhere at a company, right? Let's, you don't have a mobile team and you're just the JavaScript person that's like, hey, why don't you go look into React Native or Flutter or whatever, right? There's a, a process that you have to start with. You have to set up your environment. You have to download all these things. You have to figure out, like, if you've never written uh, React before or Flutter, you have to figure out the ecosystem and how that all works, right? With DraftBit, it's more or less a tool. You log in, you scan a QR code. We build the live native app for you on the fly. Uh, and then we do it with a, writing minimal amounts of code, right? We can't, we're not a no code platform by any means. Uh, we do have a code editor that folks can use. Uh, but a lot of the things when it comes to the entire structure of your app, right? The navigation, the screens, the carousels, you can write that without writing a single line of code and you can do that really fast. So you would uh, say you're a low code platform. Not yeah. Low code. Low code yeah. Yeah. Platform. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta get buzzwords. those buzzwords in. I know I hate it, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So we're, transformation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. And and what's it like right now? I, were you guys fully remote before, or all in an office? Uh, half and half. So we do have an office in Chicago, uh, not too far from uh, Ben, um, just across the river. Uh, and we were about. We have some folks in San Francisco. We have some folks in Barcelona. Uh, we have some folks everywhere, really. Um, and so one of my co-founders is act actually had to move to San Francisco, so he's out there. Uh, but I would say, you know, half the team is Chicago, half the team is remote. In terms of how this has all affected us, it, besides the fact that we're stuck at home, right, like day to day, right, hasn't changed. Um, there's probably more folks interested in DraftBit right now because they're stuck at home, right? I think the exciting part about all this is, you know, folks maybe realize like at their big jobs, like they, you know, they maybe spend a lot of time in traffic, right, to get to the office or whatever. And now they've got all this extra free time to explore some of the ideas that they've always wanted to build, right? And that's where DraftBit is handy. You know, the folks that used to hit me up and say, hey, I got this great idea for an app, you know, I'll give you 1% equity if you build the whole thing, right? You know, like we all, we've all had friends like that. Uh, now I'm just like, just you try to build it in draft it. And they're like, oh, cool. You know. That's amazing. I, I just love tools like that. I mean, I know Ben um, and I are both totally in love with, you know, Stackblitz, which makes it much easier for, you know, developers to kind of explore, or at least junior developers, marketers, whoever kind of explore what code looks like, but this seems like an even easier uh -huh. solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, our target isn't necessarily developers, right? A lot of developers come to DraftBit because they're interested in React Native or they just started learning how to code, right? So uh, we target, you know, a variety of different people. And we actually, you know, uh, didn't want to do the code editor, but folks are just like, you know, you sort of listen to your users. And so we, we gave them the code editor and they like it, you know? So uh, it's, it's like, it's not the first class citizen but it's like a fun tool, right? There are times where you might have to eject from DraftBit. So instead, excuse me, instead of ejecting, we're just like, hey, type in your code here and you're good, right? And then we handle the, the bundling, the deployment. Um, we're releasing PWAs too. So one click deploy to a PWA, right? Directly from DraftBit. Uh, so there's a lot of cool potential uh, paths we can take. Yeah, you're just saying all the, uh, all the right buzzwords. I hear all the executives talk about 
Yeah. No code to no code solution. Deploy immediately. You know, uh, code editor, editor for whatever. Marketers can use it. Less yeah. developers. <laughs> So I was, uh, yeah, I'm looking at the tool right now, actually. And one of the things, so I came from a design background originally. And like one of the things I can see about it immediately is it, it has some similarities to like a tool like, I don't know, like F Flash, like the actual Flash editor. And it's, I'm not comparing it to Flash, but I'm just saying like the actual, like it looks like something that most designers would be able to look at and be like, oh, I can deal with this. It's got layers and like this tree explorer on the side. So I, I can definitely see the, the attraction to this. Like if I was to recommend to a designer type person, like, hey, you, you wanted to build a mobile app, I think I would definitely send them to this because the, even just the screen layout and the demo on your front page is very recognizable as um, like kind of a weird blend of like a Visual Studio code with the navigation on the left-hand side and like, a, like the uh, Adobe tool of some sort for sure. Ben and I um, sometimes do this thing called what the hell dot dev and we should totally have you come on and do a what the hell, what the hell is recent and what the hell is uh, draft it at some point in time. <laughs> yeah, would love to do that. That'd be fun. I'm looking forward to the $50 million plus acquisition you're about to experience with this yeah. low code platform, Peter. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you're taking us all to Alinea. I don't care what you say. Yeah, There's I'll do recording. it. Yeah. What are, so what are 50 million and you're taking us to Alinea, right? That's right. 50 million, Alinea. <laughs> yeah. uh, direct competitors. <laughs> uh, there's not, you know, so there's like, uh, there's, some, there's some overlap, uh, but not necessarily uh, direct, I guess. Right? Are you so, compared to Webflow at all ever or? Paul Graham from YC calls us the uh, Webflow of mobile. Uh, uh, we've got a very close relationship with Webflow. Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. love Vlad. He's a very supportive uh, person. Uh, so there's there's Webflow, right? But they just focus on websites, right? Like we very much stay in our lane uh, mobile. Yeah. Um, there is Glide Apps. Uh, Glide Apps is an awesome service too. GlideApps.com lets you connect the Google spreadsheet to the front end of like a template, right? So some argue that we're competitors. I don't necessarily think so. I think, uh, you know, like uh, Glide Apps is the Squarespace to uh, DraftBit, right? So Webflow and Squarespace can both be successful businesses that offer, you know, different services for different types of people. Uh, so Glide, Glide Apps is great. I, I think it's, it's an awesome service too. I love the founders and their design process, right? Uh, so I respect, I respect the hell out of them. Um, and they, they focus on PWAs only and then connecting a Google Sheets. Uh, there's uh, Bravo Studio, which is like another twist, right? You can argue, is it a competitor, is it not? They have a Figma plugin, right? They're very tightly integrated with Figma and they turn Figma designs into uh, apps, right? So using like their data side of things, right? So there's a couple of these folks, right? I know there's a few more, there's Adalgo. Um, they offer, you know, uh, PWA and native based on templates, right? And I think our niche is, um, you know, connect any type of database that you want. Use Fetch, use GraphQL, right? Like we are, what we are doing is, you know, we're we're trying to generate uh, senior level code, right, for your React Native app, right? Like we're not trying to get away from this whole abstraction of like, I don't care what happens behind the scene, right? Like what DraftBit does that nobody else does is we offer you the source code, right? You get it day one, you can eject your app in the same way that you'd start a React Native project with everything uh, organized and figured out for you, like that's all there for you, right? So that's why we're a tool for teams, you know, like maybe a designer comes in and then a developer takes over and hooks up whatever else you can't do and draft it. What does the deployment look like? So uh, there are actually strict rules around uh, deploying for Apple. So PWAs is like a one click thing, right? You just like we just spin up a build server and deploy it out for you. Uh, but mobile apps, on the other hand, are a little trickier. Uh, you are not allowed to deploy on someone's behalf. So uh, we're like reworking some things. We're gonna, give, we're gonna build the IPA and the APK for you, right? Which is like the native 
uh, bundle that you need for the app store. And then all you have to do is, you know, like drag the file into, you know, the app store thing, application loader or whatever, and uh, the process has been taken care of for you. Uh, so it's a little trickier, right? It's an extra step. Uh, you have to create uh, your own iTunes account. You have to create your own Google developer account, right? Uh, but we think that's like a small sacrifice for the fact that like most of our users build like their full app experience in a couple days versus like the months that it used to take, right? That's exciting. And don't think I didn't notice you avoiding that question and commitment about taking us to Alinea. Oh, I did. <laughs> hey, if it happens, I'm avoiding the thoughts of, you know, like, oh, I really hope this works out one day. That's the, that's the thought that I was avoiding. Don't, don't jinx it. <laughs> um, what, uh, what sort of, uh, of course, I'm going to ask this, but uh, I, I, you said that you could do like GraphQL or fetch or whatever. Do you have, mm -hmm. uh, like, can you get streaming data through this? Like, could I connect to some WebSocket or use like Firebase or something like that to, to get real time updates? Uh, so we're, we don't support Firebase yet, but if we did, then you can, right? So if I don't necessarily uh, know how that would uh, work, so I guess the short answer is no, you can't, right? We just support like REST and GraphQL. And if, you're, if your GraphQL server supports subscriptions, for example, then yes. But if it doesn't, then, then no. Um, in terms of like Firebase, which is actually one of the most exciting features folks want, something that we're working on, if you use, I think it's like Firestore, right? Uh, Firestore is the new Firebase way of handling those things. Uh, through their uh, service and our GUI, you'd be able to do that. But that's, it's, not, it's not live yet. It's sort of like we're, we're still figuring things out on our end. Cool. I know some people at Firebase. <laughs> yeah, I would they, love. They're, they're big consumers of RxJS, actually. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, would love an intro. They're, Firebase has so many different things. And so part of the, the thing that I'm trying to personally tackle right now is what are the most valuable things that folks are interested in the Firebase library, so. Yeah, you should go get on a get on YouTube on uh, David East, who's one of the main folks at Firebase. He, um, he has a new YouTube show called uh, Tea Time. Oh, cool. And so like you just drink tea and play video games with him. So, you know, spend half hour, get to know him, pitch him. <laughs> Be like, how do I get acquired by Google? Like now. Yeah. <laughs> I have an Alinea commitment. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> Um, but no, that's all very exciting, everything like that. And, you know, we're, we're super excited to have you. I mean, I definitely think you got me and Ben both jazzed up about that. And of course, Ben had to do his little plugs on, how does this handle streaming data? Yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know of a particular asynchronous type that you can use to adapt just about anything. <laughs> Yeah, so really modern web podcast, whenever Ben and I do it together, is ways to pitch other folks about how they need to have more RxJS love in their <laughs> life. <laughs> right. At least ben, I'm sort of, of observable. One of my ulterior, it's right. oh, uh, sorry. Uh, one of my ulterior motives to meeting you in person was for you to give me like the sit down. You know, like I have tried to go through streams and stuff so many times and I figured out the DS way, you know, like I figured out the DS way of copying and pasting, but boy, would I like to get a, a deeper dive. So I was like, oh, wow, you know, like Ben's coming into Chicago, maybe one of these days, you know, maybe not the first dinner, but the second or third, I'll get, you know, I'll get him another drink and then we can have the conversation that I've been dying oh. to have. It's so easy to get all these boys so excited about things. <laughs> Can't tell you how many times me and Jay have gotten like really drunk and built stupid things. <laughs> 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 me and Ben are a little organized. We don't get stupid drunk. Um, for some reason, that's only with Jay. Apparently, Jay's my drinking buddy. Somebody told me that. I was like, we, st we still do like... dumb things though. Like, we still do there... dumb things, but we don't have to be drunk while we do it. Wasn't like... there one where you had to like drag a donut into Jay's mouth or something? Didn't we build an app like that? We built one where we had, or was that Jay that helped me with that? I don't remember, but I did one with like Ken Wheeler bobbleheads to kind of <laughs> um, um, 
you know, talk about, God, what, what was it? Anyways, you click a button in React Native and you keep clicking it and like Ken, Ken Wheeler's head just bobbles for a while. Um, anyways. It's pretty good. That's important stuff. Oh, yeah. That's what, that's what uh, programming was made for, really. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I did that with Jay, I can't remember, but my hardest thing about development and trying out all these new technologies is, you know, you really have to have good ideas and then like kind of stick yeah. with it. You can't just, sh sh you know, you can't just be like, I want to try a reason. Wait, now what do I do? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's when you make Ken Wheeler bobblehead apps. That's been my barrier to reason. It's been my barrier to rust. Like there's all sorts of stuff I haven't tried because I have no, like, there's, there's no need like that I have to fill that it would, it would solve. Right. Like it's, yeah. I remember what we made, Ben. It was it was Grumpy Cat, and we had a Grumpy Cat, and you could drag and drop food into Grumpy Cat's bowl, and depending on if Grumpy Cat liked it or not, you would get points. Oh, that's right. That's easy. <laughs> that's easy to see why I confused that with Jay. <laughs> hey, Peter, it's terrible. I mean, <laughs> visit my my land, my cemetery of weird ass apps. GitHub.com slash Lady Leet. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Um, Peter, is there anything you want to leave us with? Um, you know, I was thinking if anybody's interested, I don't know if you two are interested in this idea, but I could I could raffle off some drafted uh, invites if that's something that you do, right? Yeah. I, you know, well, so. I think for I think for anybody who's listening to this, I mean can can they just email you and then, you know, in the next month, maybe you choose a few? Yeah, that's totally um, cool. What's, what's the email that they should email you at? Peter at draftbit.com. So easy. Yeah. D-R-A-F-T-B-I-T, draftbit.com. And you should be able to Google that pretty easily, but Peter at draftbit.com. Please spam him. Remind him about our Alinea encounters. I'll be happy. <laughs> I will be happy too. <laughs> and we, we've, we've still got to have that talk about RX. I'm just saying the operators are oh, yeah. ripe for like drag and drop composability. You could, you could do that. With for RX. sure. You could compose behaviors in, in bits and pieces. Like I said, when this is all said and done, expect, you know, like, hey, Ben, heard you're in Chicago. You know, not the first dinner, but the second or third, right? So. Oh, come on, Peter. Just get to it. Get to I it. I know. I you know. know. This is your date. The second one, <laughs> you're already moving on to, you know, home run, second base, wh whichever one you consider, uh, <laughs> JS, learn, you know, it's pretty easy to snipe I'm, me. Guys. I'm pretty, I'm pretty cheap. All you need to do is just get me a beer. That's probably, yeah. that's probably enough. Works for me. Cool. <laughs> I'm not cheap though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll take you to Alinea and I'll get it higher. That's right. You buy Ben a beer, yeah. but your real payment is taking me to dinner. And then we'll go that way. So I met him. I think my I think my rates just changed. <laughs> um, anyway, can we end with a um, a developer joke? Okay. My, I mean, okay. I could say my life, right? But that's not funny. Maybe it is because I'm a developer. I'm gonna tell you all all a joke, and you and you guys can tell me the. Okay. You guys can guess. Okay. Why did the developer quit his job? Tracy, this might have even been in the the questions that you sent me at Chicago JS. Ooh, that was good. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot that we did that together. I yeah. gave Peter a bunch of jokes and it went over <laughs> so well. I <laughs> think about Ben, do you know the, the answer to this? It sounds familiar. Come on, Ben. I can't believe it. Hmm. Why did the developer quit his job? I don't know. Go for it. Because he didn't get a raise. A raise, of course. A R A Y S. A raise. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. Anyways, thanks everyone for tuning yeah. in on this episode of Modern Web Podcast. Again, you can follow me on Twitter, Lady Leach. You can follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Lush. Definitely check out Draftbit if you want to win a chance for um, some. Is it licenses for yeah. for Draftbit? It, yes, email Peter, Peter at draftbit.com. No can joke, this, this, this tool looks really cool. It does. Yeah. I'm, I think it looks awesome. It'll be even better when it's using observables, right, Ben? 
Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but you can follow Peter on Twitter as well, at Peter P. Me. And uh, besides that, tune in next time, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.